I'm going to introduce a very dear friend of mine and colleague, Dominic Coit. There we go. Dom, uh, let me hand the mic to you. So my name is Dominic Coit. I work for the Borough Cheese Company in London. And before that, I work for Neil's Yard Dairy. Uh, so these are some thoughts I've got on um, the small-scale um, cheese producing in the UK. So what follows stems from various discussions and thoughts about the farmhouse cheese industry in Britain. reasons that will become obvious later. In particular, I've thought about the work of Neil's Yard Dairy and the role of the cheesemonger. It seemed to me that both were successful. British farmhouse cheese, once so little thought of, can now hold its own with the world's finest. Neil's Yard Dairy is synonymous with quality and has done as much as anyone else in the promotion of farmhouse cheeses worldwide. Yet success breeds imitation. Where are all the new Neil's Yards dairies? Where are all the new cheesemakers making cheddar, Stilton, Cheshire, Lancashire and Caerphilly? It is from these questions that the following thoughts have developed. I'm not advocating anything prescriptive, merely thinking aloud and following the lines of thought without worrying about the consequences. That's for others braver than myself. How to get more of what I like. Recently, I tried a Cheshire-style cheese made by some friends who live along the border of England and Wales. One of them I met in a churchyard in South London, chatted for a while on a bench, and then retired to a nearby cafe for an impromptu tasting. After tea and a rather intimidating cake, we tried the cheese. It had a lighter texture than I was expecting. Beneath the characteristic tang are the delicate flavours played with the outer reaches of my descriptive abilities. He told me how it was made from the milk of just eight cows, used a starter cultivated from the same milk, and that the cheeses were made in the warm confines of the kitchen, amongst all the hubbub you'd expect to find with a small child gurgling in the corner. It tasted good. It was a cheese of real character. Rashly, I asked how a cheese like this might become more widely available. What do you want, came the reply. My friend explained that cheese making... Oh, which one's that? I might, I might need that one. Che <laughs> yeah, that's the end one, okay. Cheese making for them was a part of their day. It had its place as much as anything else on their, on their small holding. It was not a means to make money or inflate esteem. It was an end in itself. It was a way of life. And because of this, the cheese was made with attention, absorption, precision, care, and thoughtfulness. The rewards for my friends were the engagement with something that could never be exactly replicated from day to day. Something that would throw up as many questions as answers, and as such, would continue to inspire and intrigue. It occurred to me that cheese making was a broad church. At one extreme, you have my friend making cheese in the kitchen from the milk of eight cows, and at the other, the large creameries producing vast tons of cheese from millions of liters of milk from the commodity market. It's all cheese making, however. One pole, that of my friends, which I will call the existential pole, produces cheese with maximal engagement and attention. The other, which seeks seemingly limitless reach for its produce, I will call the total pole. Here, making cheese is exclusively a means to create a successful business, increase shareholder premiums, market share, growth, and brand awareness. But as I say, one is not wholly alien to the other. I imagined something like a slide rule. At one end was my friend, at the other, the corporation. If in answer to my question about the wider availability of my friend's cheese was met with a more encouraging response, it would, in effect, mean moving along the slide rule away from the existential pole towards the total. 
it would mean increasing availability at the expense of a way of life. For as you move along the rule, you increase production, incur additional costs, expose yourself to regulation, etc. In theory, the corporation could move towards the existential pole, decentralize its operation, reduce its market share, lessen the concerns of a branding, and rid itself of the, of the illusion that the addition of a nut or an apricot into a lump of curd was nothing short of innovation. However, King Canute had as much chance stopping the waves as the corporation of swimming against its revenue stream. Now, I have to confess, I've read quite a few books on cheese making and its history in my time, but not as much as I've read of Karl Marx and the struggle of the working class. Now, maybe some residue of the latter informed my desire to ask the question about broadening the availability of quality cheese. Why should all the best have only a limited public? Or to take a different angle, how can good quality cheese reach a broader audience? To help answer this question, I'm going to employ my slide rule. First, however, I need to make clear what I mean by quality. This is a highly generic term, generic and mobile term. It can serve the market that sells cheddar with caramelized onions as much as the farmhouse cheese made from the Yorkshire Dales or the Po Valley. Rather than get bogged down in unrealistic definition, let you tell me my criteria for quality. It's divided up under four headings. Ingredients, manufacture, product character, and attitude or spirit. Firstly, let's take ingredients. Milk quality is the most important. Without getting into TBCs, let's just say that the milk has to be microbiologically healthy. But other more physical things come into play. How much is the milk pumped? How many containers, stroke length of pipe, separate milk and its journey from cow to vat? How long is it chilled and at what temperature? A principle of milk quality could be expressed as the milk must be in the vat as quickly as possible and as little altered as possible. So milk quality will be reduced by pasteurization, chilling, etc. It is not necessarily bad milk, far from it, but according to our rubric, it has lost quality potential. Secondly, manufacture. I'm sure such a sophisticated audience as this is familiar with the writings of the philosophers Friedrich Nietzsche and Baruch Spinoza, and their ed edict, become what you are. If you are a cheesemaker, that means making cheesemaking decisions. If the manufacturing process maximizes the cheesemaking decisions, this increases the quality of that process. The hands of the large-scale creamery operative will most likely be more familiar with the feel of buttons and switches than junket and curd. Thirdly, product character. A cheese that is exactly the same day after day is, according to my definition, a cheese with less quality potential than one that changes. Diversity within the scope of a particular recipe reflects quality of manufacture and quality of ingredients in that both realize the uniqueness of ingredients and the uniqueness of the decision-making process that is involved in making a cheese on any particular day. Distinctiveness and diversity within recipe equals quality. I know this is not what a cheesemaker is trying to achieve, quite the opposite in fact. If you're making a cheddar, you'll want it to taste like a cheddar, as opposed to a Cheshire, Telegio, Celeres, or God forbid, a laughing cow. But often what counts as, a cheddar, as a cheddar, for example, is too narrow. By my measure, to help increase quality or product character will be to change from a prepared commercial status to ones made on the farm. Fourthly, attitude or spirit. This is about engagement. Adherence to the first three aspects of quality will help stimulate the engagement by allowing the char character of the product to shine through, which in turn necessitates the decision-making process and the involvement in what is happening. Quality of product cannot be divorced from the culture and spirit of the people involved, 
And a great part of this spirit is engendered in a willingness to take risks and experiment. So now we know where we're headed, how do we get there? Let's go back to the slide rule. If we move our cursor along the slide rule, away from my friend's way of making cheese, that is, away from the existential pole, what happens? Well, firstly, we process more milk. The question then becomes, how much milk can we turn into cheese before we start to compromise on quality? At the Capacazine Dairy in South London, they process around 600 litres a day, four days a week at their peak. The milk for cheese making is from the morning milk only, so it is not chilled. Before the milk reaches the bulk tank from the parlour, it is intercepted and filled into churns, where a homemade starter has already been added. An hour and a half later, the milk is poured into a vat after being transported the 35 miles, 56 kilometres, from farm to cheese making dairy. William Oglethorpe, the owner, reckons with a larger vat and a small milk tank, he could double the amount of milk he processes while still maintaining the rudiments of milk quality, unpasteurized, unchilled use of homemade starter. How much more milk can be processed in this way will depend upon other factors such as space, equipment, labor, and what constitutes a reasonable length of the working day. But let's say we can process a thousand liters of unchilled, unpasteurized morning milk, and we can use a homemade starter. So how will this affect manufacture? As long as the cheese maker can see the milk and feel the curd, not much, you might say, then the key cheese making decisions necessitated by an engaged attitude to the task will remain unaffected. What will change, however, will be the effort required to process the increased amount of milk. Unlike some of the big European cheeses like Conte, for example, a lot of work in the vat happens when making the main British territorial cheeses. A thousand litres of milk will produce around 100 kilos of curd. And although one person could handle that much in a day when making a cheese like Conte, when making a Cheshire, for example, the demands of the recipe would, in my opinion, be more, met more comfortably with two. In many respects, the manufacturing process, as volumes increase, poses the most difficult problems, not necessarily with the cheese, but with the cheese maker. Anyone who's made cheese will tell you that most of the time you spend worrying or washing up. And although as you increase production, the worry might not get any worse, the washing up certainly will. So any increase in production will encounter a workload that could be demoralizingly high and negatively affect the attitude stroke spirit of the workforce. Product character. Here I see little problem. Distinctiveness and diversity will remain so long as one, the increased milk process remains unpasteurized. Two, the milk remains unchilled. Three, starters are homemade. And four, man the manufacturing workload is not so onerous as to stifle cheese making decisions being made in the interest of the cheese. Attitude and spirit. Here, similar to those I mentioned in relation to manufacture, occur some of the more intract intractable problems. And here too, I think, is the biggest challenge to finding how far along the slide rule we can move our cursor from the existential to the total pole while still achieving our goal. The central problems are one of finance and ownership. The costs of setting up a dairy from scratch are for many would-be cheesemakers, prohibitively expensive. If someone were to find the finance, the cash flow pressures but buying milk and locking that money in maturing cheese presents further challenges. One possible solution, one already being used back in the UK, is occasioned by the poor price for milk. One of the large industrial creameries in the southwest of England was paying their milk producers 21.7 pence per litre in July 2016. The price rose to 30 pence per litre in February 2017. This wild fluctuation represented the changes in supply on the world commodity market. Over this period, the cost of milk production for the top 5% milk producers in the UK, the biggest, was 24.2 pence per litre the smallest 5%, around 37 pence per litre. 
Capacese, admittedly buying organic milk with a higher cost per litre than conventional, buy milk for cheese making at a healthy 45 pence per litre. This potential for paying more for the cheese making milk has not gone unnoticed. There are partnerships between milk producer, stroke farmer, and cheesemaker that could offer blueprints for moving along our slide rule to help produce the greater availability of quality cheese. One such model has been established where the farmer, milk producer, has put forward capital to establish a dairy which is then leased out to an established farmhouse cheesemaker who in turn buys the milk at a premium. But this model needs to accommodate risk and experimentation. Too often, the spirit of adventurous cheesemaking is strangled by a need to realise investment too early, or just fearful of making a mistake and losing money. As a consequence, recipes are tweaked to render them safe and commercially acceptable, and this compromises our quality potential by being more predictable and shying away from diversity. So the start-up capital burden borne by the milk producer seems a good initiative in our goal. If within this model, provision were made for a two-speed recipe development, allowing a research and development period to work on and experiment with a chosen recipe, I mean, this could be as simple as just having a 100 litre vat to make one cheese over a period of however long, this would help increase engagement. Now, some of you will be farmers or cheesemakers who have a lot at stake and are unwilling to embrace anything as cavalier as I'm suggesting. But I'm not advocating a wholesale rejection of existing models of making farmhouse cheese, nor suggesting anyone like Colson Bassett, the Stilton maker, should stop pasteurising their milk. I'm talking about future producers of cheese and how they can add to the many great farmhouse cheeses already being made. So let's recap and assess our new dairy. We have a building and equipment, capital supplied by the milk producer, and a supply of morning milk, raw, and acidified by our own farm produced starter. We have two employees to meet the needs of processing a thousand litres of milk four days a week. Until full production is met, both will be employed on developing, stroke honing down their recipe over a period of however long. But where have these employees come from? Previously, I mentioned a partnership of cheese makers and milk producers. Wouldn't it make more sense for the farmer to supply the labour, either from their family or their employee? I would suggest not, or at least not necessarily. Although there are many successful farmhouse cheese producing families making cheese for their own milk, Applebee's, Montgomery's, Kirkham's, Clark, Jones's, often is it the case that a family is making cheese because their forebears did so. It is following tradition following a recipe handed down, but without the cheesemaking engagement to ensure that what is being produced is of the highest quality possible. Here we find cheesemaking by rote. Now it's important to recognize that cheese made in this way are closer on our rule to the cheeses made with the utmost attention and care. And, the, and given the flexible, flexibility of the cheese retail market, successful businesses can be built in this way but it is at the expense of character, distinctiveness, and the qualities that will make the cheese stand out. And to enhance these qualities, the pool of people from whom the future cheesemakers need to come are those for whom cheesemaking is more a passion than an expectation. A spirit of curiosity and adventure will better allow the production of cheese with character. Without a robust character, these cheeses risk being subsumed under a more generic generic identities, and ultimately disappearing altogether. But of course, these future cheesemakers need training. The old dairy schools need to be resuscitated. The School of Artisan Food on the Welbeck Estate in Nottinghamshire is showing a way forward. But this could be enhanced by existing farmhouse cheesemakers offering apprenticeships, and perhaps setting aside some of their profits to establish their own R&D on site or contributing to a broader collegiate kitty under the auspices of a body such as the SCA in the UK or similar bodies elsewhere. Along our slide rule, we have entered the heart of our dilemma. How to maintain character of product and maximal cheesemaking engagement, my definition of quality, whilst generating sufficient quantity to achieve financial viability. 
Here I think the quantity issue could be resolved by employing a collective dairy model, much like that used for making Conte. Here, local farmers supply the capital for creating a dairy, employ a cheesemaker, and supply the dairy with milk. In the Franche Comté, this model works well. The milk used for cheesemaking is raw. It does, common with most cheesemaking, use morning and evening milk, so the evening milk is stored and, hand around, and held around, around 12 degrees. Though the mesophile starters are commercial, the thermophile ones are made from the previous day's whey, effectively homemade, which will contribute to the distinctiveness of the cheese. From our perspective, the fruitier model has one disadvantage. The cheesemaker has no ownership in the venture. Having a real stake in the business will maximise the sense of engagement and help maintain an active relationship to cheesemaking which other might, might otherwise weaken. To further increase the dynamism of our cooperative model, I would incorporate cheese maturation or affinage. This would involve large initial costs. To offset this, production would be limited at first and grow at only at such times as finance is permitted. Here it might be advisable for the co-op to act as retailer too, selling on site as most fruitiers in the Franche-Comté do, but also in local or regional markets. The larger margins attained this way might help mitigate high capital costs involved in keeping maturation in-house. Now the rationale for creating a cooperative venture that incorporates milk production, cheese making, maturation and sale is twofold. One, it allows production of a greater quantity of cheese that embody quality. And two, it creates a diverse business that potentially enhances engagement and encourages longer employee participation and thus the retention and development of skills. A problem might appear to emanate from monopoly and the inherent tendency to replicate and thus reduce character. But if, again, like in the Conte region, the co-ops were aggregated around a village or town, then each region would supply enough competition, as it were, to nullify this. There is another issue, however. My original question was how to increase the availability of quality cheese. It seems we have begun to create a model that could, in, could indeed achieve this in the cheese-making regions. But what about those like myself who live in the metropolis? You've got it. Okay. Thank you. In the 19th century, British cheese-making tried to feed the appetite of fast-expanding cities. It couldn't keep up. Factory-produced cheese from the USA forced cheese prices down, and to compete, British cheesemakers sold their cheese younger and younger until they had no character and no future. To go down the same road would be folly. To maintain character is to maintain diversity. To sell a cheese that is not the same from one day to the next requires retailing skills like that offered by the likes of Niels Yarderi. In that Niels Yarderi selects and buys from the farm, it acts like an old fashioned cheese factor an itinerant cheese broker, an agent for the town or city. A complaint often made against the factor was that they would buy up all the best cheese and leave the farmer with the rest. But if the farmer is part of a co-op, then he's a retailer too. He would not surrender his best cheese. But equally, if he's to have a foothold in the urban market, he'll need to surrender some. Now, individual bargaining might find an accommodation here, but I would propose the establishment of a guild for each regional cheese type. Each guild would establish fairs, say six a year. At each fair, the co-op will, will be required to put up for sale 50% of its best cheese to factors. The quality of the cheeses would be established by members of the guild who would act as graders, ensuring fairness and transparency. In this way, trade links between town and country will be based on a mutually, mutually beneficial relationship. So before I finish, let's recap once more. My question was, how can quality cheese become more widely available? Or to put it another way, how far can we increase the production of quality cheese before we lose sight of why we wanted to start making cheese in the first place? The central issue is about managing scale. What happens when a cheese making operation becomes larger? 
What are the effects on product character and staff morale? What I have suggested is anchored in the need to produce cheese of quality, that is, cheese of character and distinctiveness. For me, raw milk, traditional rennet and homemade starters are key to achieve this. To produce more cheese in this way requires processing more milk on cooperative lines. Individual calves need to be dynamic, constantly evolving and willing to experiment. Collective ownership, participation in maturation and sales will help maintain and increase engagement and this in turn will help maintain and develop skills. The burgeoning carts will grow, grow alongside one another, village to village, say, and develop and cohere under the umbrella of a guild. The guild, in turn, will establish fairs for the sale of cheese to factors, wholesalers, retailers, as well as the general public, and therein consolidate trade lines between the cheese-making regions and larger urban centres. As I said at the outset, these are only a loose assemblage of thoughts, something to chew on. They raise more questions than they answer. But with the milk price currently as low as it is, and small farms in the UK decreasing every year, now seems to be the time to start think differently if we are to maintain a viable cheese, uh, farmhouse cheese sector for the future. This is then perhaps more a call to arms, a call for change. And so if I may paraphrase the great revolutionary Karl Marx, cheese makers of the world, unite. Thank <laughs> you.